All right, so we've been discussing the regulation of the cell cycle using this thing called the cell cycle clock, um, which is the rate setter in the cycle. And progression is regulated based off of the presence and abundance of two different types of molecules, protein kinases and cyclins. And we're going to start out with the kinases. So first of all, someone tell me what is a kinase. ASC tells us that it's an enzyme. And a kin, K-I-N, always phosphorylates. So this is an enzyme that phosphorylates. Now these kinases, they are said to be constitutively expressed. And this term, constitutively expressed, means that they're expressed at a constant concentration and they're always present. Okay. So these are not fluctuating in any way. They're constantly and uh, abundantly expressed. So they're constitutively expressed. However, most of the time, these kinases are circulating throughout the organism in an inactive form. So even though they're present, they are considered to be inactive, meaning they cannot really cause anything to happen. In order for them to be activated, they have to be, <coughs> excuse me, they have to be attached to our second molecule, which are the proteins called the cyclins. So what you can see, and you, you, you notice it in this figure, is I have a couple different cycles. I have the thing called the mitotic cycling, and then over here I have my G1 cycle. It's the cyclins that are going to be upregulated and degraded, and then when they are upregulated, they attach to the CDK, the, the cyclin-dependent kinase, and that activates. So at this G1 checkpoint, what we need to have happen, or really at any of the checkpoints, so this can apply to any of the checkpoints. I'm going to give you an example of the G2 check. You should be able to apply these same kind of rules to this G2 checkpoint as well, which is a G2M transition. So from G2 transition into M. I mean, what are some of the things that we would want to be thinking about here as we transition from G2 into M? We want to know, are all of our chromosomes doing do we have enough resources to go through mitosis, which is energetic material? So these are going to be some of the things that have to be checked, so to speak, at this G2 checkpoint. Because the CDKs, the cyclin dependent kinases, are constitutively expressed, we're going to have CDK level, CDK levels constant throughout the whole cycle. And they're going to be constant here as we approach mitosis in our G2 checkpoint. In response to some of the things that are happening in the cell, such as increase in chromosomal number as we duplicate our chromosomes, collection of additional raw materials that are required for mitosis. These events act as stimuli to cause the cyclins to begin to build up. And they're going to begin to develop, they're going to begin to be expressed. The cyclins are expressed, and as they build up in abundance, they get to what's called a critical point. And the critical point occurs because we have a high enough abundance of those cyclins that they begin to favorably interact with the cyclin dependent kinases. So we begin to form a complex.
called the cyclin CDK complex. So you can see that the mitotic CDK, <clears throat> which is going to be involved here at the D2 checkpoint, it is going to begin. I'm sorry, the cyclin is here. Here's our CDK. The cyclin is going to begin to increase in abundance. So it's turned on in response to the events that are occurring in S phase and during D2. As we increase the number of these particular protein molecules, abundance increases, we begin to interact with ATP to pull off an inorganic phosphate. And all of this gets added up to the mitotic CDK to form our active mitotic CDK cycling complex, or our CDK cycling complex. Okay? When we form that complex, what happens to the cyclin dependent kinase, the CDK, is it becomes active. So this is now the active isoform of CDK. And when it is active, it's a kinase. So what does kinase begin to do? It begins to phosphorylate stuff. Because that's what kinase is doing. So some of the places that we're going to begin to see phosphorylation occur is in the nucleus, as the nuclear envelope responds to that active CDK, and it will begin to degrade. And the way that this works, there are support proteins that are incorporated into the nuclear envelope, and they're called lamina. How many of you have ever heard that term, lamina? Where did you hear that term, lamina? What's that? What did you say? Lamin. Did you say that's boring? <laughs> yeah. Okay. There is one called lamin. 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 Anyone know? As soon as I tell you, like, oh, yeah. Louis, Louis Giglio? Yeah. He's kind of overselling it big time. Sorry to burst your bubble. It's literally holding you together. Yeah. Um, no lies. <laughs> so yeah, laminin is a structural protein. And they come in a variety of different uh, appearances. One of them has a sort of cross-shaped structure. Um, it's not the what's literally holding you together. That form of laminin is found um, in a very small a number of organizations. Laminin overall, this thing called laminin, or this class of molecules called laminin, they are structural proteins. And they do hold things together. They hold membranes together, they hold tissues. So what if I were to phosphorylate laminin, laminin molecules? Those laminin molecules would begin to actually lose their function or change their shape to change their function because I'm binding phosphates. So in the nuclear envelope, we begin to see that degrade because that active CD, CDK phosphorylates the lamina containing the laminin that supports the nuclear envelope. So in the lamina or lamina, the, the structural proteins, including laminin, are what are actually being phosphorylated by the active CDK. Again, whenever we attach something to a protein, that protein Change of shape, change its function. And by changing the shape, we reduce the support. So now the support structure is actually beginning to disappear for the nuclear envelope, and it's going to begin to fall apart because it's going to be less structure. So that's just one small example of what happens. The cyclin increases in concentration in response to cellular events, creating the cyclin CDK complex, which is the active form of the CDK, 
And then that CDK goes through and uses phosphates to phosphorylate a bunch of other um, proteins, including structural proteins and help together, they're not all one or connected, and the nucleus begins to fall apart. So how do we switch everything off? So we can turn the system on, but what about switching the system off? To switch off, it's actually sort of a suicide system because the CDKs themselves that have been activated are going to be the same molecules that phosphorylate the cyclin CDK complex to begin to turn that system off. This typically ends mitosis or occurs near the end of mitosis. One of the enzymes or one of the proteins that the site and CDK complex activates is a proteolytic enzyme. So that proteolytic enzyme increases its activity. It gets upregulated by the cyclin uh, CDK complex. And it's actually going to attack the cyclin. So we turn on, we're going to turn on the cyclin dependent. Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to turn on the proteolytic enzyme by phosphorylating the proteolytic enzyme, and it begins to degrade the cyclin. So the cyclin begins to be broken apart. Okay? Now, as that cyclin breaks apart, it's breaking apart because we are. phosphorylating the enzyme. Turn it on. So the enzyme proteolytic enzyme is phosphorylated by the cyclin CDK and then it goes back in and actually begins to degrade the cyclin in the complex. This happens when we get enough of these enzymes phosphorylated and so this is a progressive process. As mitosis progresses and we get closer and closer to the end, we're going to get to a critical point where this proteolytic enzyme reaches the max activity. By this point, we're now going to begin to, do, uh, begin to do some serious degradation of the cyclin proteins. Critical point of enzyme activity is what actually results in degradation. Now We do have some additional internal control or secondary control that happens here. Um, you know, we want to have a lot of redundancy in biological systems. So if one system fails, we have another system pop out. So the internal control for cell cycle, we create these things called weight signals. And 
And this particular weight signal associated with the G2 transition point uh, it, it basically allows metaphase to progress, to transition to anaphase once the metaphase plate is developed. So we want to hold off and allow the metaphase plate to form before we begin to split the chromosome. Because what if the metaphase plate phase doesn't form and I begin to split the chromosomes? Chances are I'm going to have unequal distribution and I'm going to have one daughter cell that has more chromosomes than it's supposed to and one daughter cell that has less. And both of those cells are going to be are not going to be viable. So I want to have this weight signal to basically say we're going to only go forward through mitosis once the metaphase plate has developed. So this whole process of uh, internal control and developing the weight signal uh, is associated with the kinetic order. So hopefully you remember that the kinetic core is that protomaceous plaque that we find um, associated with the centromere. And it's actually going to be the motor complex that helps to move the chromosomes around the cell during mitosis to line them up on the metaphase plate and then to take it to the anaphase split. The kinetic core complex. If that kinetic core complex is not attached to this thing called anaphase pro promoting complex, anaphase is not going to progress. So if we don't have high levels of the mitotic complex uh, site binding up to CDK, forming the active comp, uh, CDK cyclin complex, that weight signal that is always sort of on is going to prevent this interaction between anaphase promoting complex and the kinetic core. And so we're not going to have any sort of um, separation through anaphase. So we have to, again, override that weight signal before we can begin to have that promoting complex interact with the kinetic core, which is going to be that signal that we begin to have anaphase occur. So once all of our spindles are attached up to the kinetic core, and we have our G2 end transition okay, we have that go-ahead signal because of the active CDK cycling complex, the weight signal is going to be overshadowed, or we can say that the signal is lifted. And that APC complex is now going to be activated by our cyclic CDK complex. And when it gets activated, the proteins that are involved in holding the sister chromatid together, those structural proteins are going to be phosphorylated. And when they are phosphorylated, the new structure that forms is for those proteins to no longer hold the chromatin together, and now they can be instantly separated by the actions of motor protein involved in it. Is 
everybody have what they need here? We're going to shift gears. Name the mitosis. And we're going to take a look now at meiosis. So this would be a brand new lecture for your notes. You can title it meiosis. So mitosis was occurring in cells that are out in the body, uh, what we would call somatic cells. You also have a tissue in organisms that are uh, that are called uh, that's called the germline. This is not somatic tissue. In the germline, this is where the sex gametes are going to be produced. The cells that contain all of the chromosome, all of the chromosomes required for fertilization to happen and not produce an organism that has the wrong number of chromosomes. So the germline for mammals, the germline in males is the testicular tissue. The germline in females is going to be found in the ovarian tissue. Mitosis, you start out with chromosomes in humans that number to 46. You double that to 42, and then you split those cells apart, and you end up with two new cells that have 46 chromosomes. In meiosis, our end product is going to have to be 23 chromosomes. Because what will happen is we'll use the sperm cell for dad and the egg cell for mom to reunite 23 chromosomes in each cell to produce the 46 chromosomes to get your first cell called the consensus. Okay? Meiosis is the process that's dedicated to forming those gametes that contain half of the chromosome numbers uh, to the somatic cells. So for humans, 23 chromosomes rather than 46 chromosomes. And it's just chromosomes 1 through 23. 1 through 22 are the, are the uh, autosomal chromosomes, and then 23 is going to be our sex chromosome, our X or our Y. So we want to be able to generate these cells systematically to contain the right number of chromosomes so that during fertilization, uh, conception results in a viable cell that can produce many organisms. So meiosis is going to produce, for many mammals, including humans, what are called haploid cells, which include sperm and the egg. And haploid, remember that your somatic cells are all different. And that means they have two copies of each chromosome. So two copies of one, two copies of the second chromosome, two copies of the third chromosome, and so on and so forth. The haploid cell, half is going to be just one copy. So you have one chromosome one, one chromosome two, and so on. And so forth. meiosis is used as a part of this thing called the life cycle. And I'm going to give you an example of the human life cycle. Now, the human life cycle is something that's pretty common for other mammalian species. Uh, and we can use this very similar life cycle model for your dog or your cat or your cow that lives across the street. But then there are other organisms, fungi, uh, protists, bacteria, that have very different life cycles. So I'm just going to give you some generalities focused on the human life cycle, and I'm going to leave that organismal stuff to our organismal biologists. So what you can see is the human life cycle starts out with haploid cells that are produced through meiosis to form a conceptus or a zygote. Really, it's forming a cell that has, in humans, the 46 chromosomes required for living function. Through mitosis is how we take that individual cell and we help it to replicate to produce growth and new tissues as we go through the stages of life. And you'll notice that mitosis is primarily used throughout the rest of life to get to our adult stage. Now, meiosis is still occurring, but specifically occurring to produce sperm and cell just in the testicular tissue and the ovarian tissue in humans, what we would call the germline. 
So our human life cycle, we're going to have two main types of cells, and I've already mentioned those. So humans consist of two cell types. These are going to be the somatic cells. And somatic or soma, that just simply is referring to the body. S-O-M-A is the Latin derivative for body. So somatic cells are body cells. So the cells that make up your muscles are somatic cells. The cells that make up your liver are somatic cells. Brain cells, neurons are somatic cells. These cells only undergo mitosis. And when a somatic cell undergoes mitosis, it is either undergoing it for repair purposes, to repair tissue and cells that have been lost, or to add new cells to accommodate new growth. In these somatic cells, there are 46 chromosomes in humans. And of those 46 chromosomes that are present, we refer to 44 of them as homologous chromosomes. Now, a homologous chromosome, so 1 through 22, chromosomes 1 through 22, those pairs are considered homologous. Homologous means that they contain the same genes. Now, even though they contain the same genes, and so what I'm saying is chromosome uh, 13 has the um, has the gene for the beta strain of chemo. So both the chromosome 13 you receive from mom and the chromosome 13 you receive from dad, they contain that same gene, the gene for beta strand of hemoglobin. But what that does not mean is that the sequence of those genes, the nucleotide sequence, it's not identical. In fact, they could be identical or they could be different. So not necessarily identical. These homologous chromosomes are called the autosomes. And because they have two pairs of each chromosome, we're going to refer to these cells as being diploid. So what does it mean to be diploid? Two pairs of each chromosome. So the diploid cell for humans is diploid because of the 23 pairs that exist. So one of the ways that I can represent the diploid nature of these cells is I can call them 2N, where N refers to one of the chromosomes in the pair. So that's 44 of our chromosomes. How many do we have in humans? 46. So we know that there's one pair that doesn't fit into this homologous chromosome category. And they're going to be distinct. Now, these chromosomes may not have the same genes. Depends on what your gender or your sex is. If you are female, you will have the same genes, and they will act very similar to our homologous chromosomes, because it'll be a XX genotype. For males, or XY, and the X chromosome and the Y chromosome contain very different genes. The X chromosome contains the androgen receptor. So women will have, or females will have, 
two versions of the antigen receptor. Males will only have one version of the antigen receptor. So not necessarily the same genes are going to be the present are going to be present on these chromosomes. They are referred to as the sex chromosomes. In males, we represent uh, in mammals, males as X, Y, and uh, females as X, X. Yeah. The 44 chromosomes that contain the same genes, but they're not necessarily identical. And then on the one hand, they're not the same. What do you mean by that? They're not necessarily the same, but not necessarily identical. Yeah, so remember that you have nucleotide sequences. HGCs and Ts. Those HGCs and Ts code for individual proteins that produce the actual protein. So if you have um, let's say chromosome 1, and you have your chromosome 1 from mom, and then you have your chromosome 1 from dad. This may represent a specific gene. That gene may be the aromatase gene, which is the gene that converts testosterone to estrogen. But when we get down to the actual sequence here, so if I take a look at the sequence of this gene, we may have A, G, A, A here for that particular version of the gene, or A, G, T, A here. So there's a little bit of a difference. And, and it may not have any consequence, but it may actually alter the protein sequence just a little bit, causing the function to be just a little bit different. When you get to Mendelian genetics, you're going to call those things alleles. Those are going to be the two different alleles. Typically, one is dominant, one is recessive, if it's a classical Mendelian trait, which a lot of our traits are not. They're actually more complex, complex traits. But that's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Now here for the distinct pair, not the same genes, and I guess I'm going to qualify that for males. For females, they're going to be. You're going to get an X chromosome from dad, you're going to get an X chromosome from mom, and the genes are going to be the same. We're going to find the androgen receptor on both of those chromo X chromosomes, but again, the sequence might be a little bit different. But for, for males, we'll get androgen receptor from mom, and then on the Y chromosome, we get the SRY gene which programs us to be mad. It's sex determined. It produces a hormone called testes determined. It helps to develop male reproductive organs, organs that then drive sex development and the organization of the brain to be a male brain and all that kind of stuff. Which, by the way, a fun fact, does anyone have to know <clears throat> what hormone actually masculinizes the male brain? It's actually not testosterone, it's actually estrogen. And if you ever take endocrinology, there's a plug for the third class. It's not about how that is and why that is. So these haploid cells, the cells that contain. Uh, 23, uh, 23 individual chromosomes, not in pairs, haploid, called sex cells, and they are in humans and other mammals, sperm, and egg. They're typically referred to as the gametes. So the gamete is referring to the sex cell. Again, these chromosomes are not paired. Call those haploid. Now, anyone remember what our chromosome number designation was for our somatic cells? Two n. What do you think about the haploid cell? What would our chromosome designator be for our haploid cells? Just n. An 
again, we find the sperm and egg cells being produced and contain the specialized tissue called the germline. So that's just a special tissue. We find a testicular tissue and a tissue. So these N containing, N chromosome containing cells, they combine during fertilization and they recombine and what happens is the sperm cell, the, the, what's called the acrosome, is degraded and that deposits the chromosomes into the egg. And then that egg and all the mitochondria, so everybody, everybody here that you get your mitochondrial DNA from mom, this is why, because we're just depositing chromosomes from the sperm into that existing egg, and so you're going to get DNA, uh, uh, DNA from mom and the DNA from dad, but then all of mom's organelles that were in that cell. That contrary to the complex and uh, they can open cytoplasm all the time. So that fertilization the sperm fuses with the ova or with the female sex game. And the result here is to produce a cell that is now ziploid. So mathematically, how how do I represent fertilization? N plus N equals 2N. So I get 23 chromosomes from each parent if I'm a human. During this fusion of, of sperm and really delivery of this chromosome containment of the sperm into the egg, this is where I reunite the pairs. And so now I have pairs that have formed, so we can call it diploid. And ultimately, what it comes down to is I'm going to take somatic cells containing 46 chromosomes. And I'm going to convert them into sex gametes containing 23 chromosomes. So if I use mitosis, I'm never going to get there. So what we actually do is we use this process called meiosis. And meiosis is really, in one sense, mitosis followed by another type of nuclear division. We're going to refer to them as mitosis 1 and mitosis 2. But basically, the same idea is kind of applied here. We're going to double our chromosome, which gives us 92. We're going to split that in half, which gives us 46. We're going to give that, uh, we're going to split that in half, those two 46 containing chromosome uh, cells in half to get four 23 containing chromosomes. So to go from the 46 chromosomes to the 23 chromosomes in our sex cells, we need to divide those in half, and that is the whole purpose of the germline. That's what happens in the germline. So let's talk a little bit about a generalized process here for meiosis. This again is happening in the cells of the germline, whereas mitosis occurs in our somatic cells. So this really isn't a cycle. It really is more of a linear path. Mitosis was a cycle because we basically used a cell, divided it into two new cells, and then those two new cells divided into two new cells, divided into two new cells over and over and over again in a cycle. Here, we're actually going to take an individual cell, 
and we're going to take it through the stages of meiosis, and we're going to end up with our cells that have 23 chromosomes. They are not going to go through a process again. They're going to be used for fertilization. Maybe. Most likely not, but eventually to the point that they could be used. throughout the fertilization process. So the generalized process basically go through meiosis 1 to meiosis 2. Each of these is coupled to nuclear division and then also a type of cytokinesis. And we go from before meiosis having 2N to doubling as we enter into meiosis, we have 4N, and then we go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, diophase, one for all of those, and that takes our 4N and it divides it up into 2, 2N cells, and then each of these go through meiosis 2, prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, diophase 2, and the end result now is for both of these to produce two end containing cells. And so we end up with four end cells, four humans, four cells. So you've already looked at this whole process. You should know that there's going to be a G1 and an S phase, and then we're going to enter into G2 and then go into uh, our mitotic process or a meiotic process. Meiosis occurs in prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, all ones to form two cells, uh, prophase two, metaphase two, no intervening interphase by the way, prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and then we have that telophase out of kinesis to produce about four new cells, each with just like pairs of chromosomes for human or generalized just chromosomes. Give me about 12 more minutes. We'll pick up on the